My name is Robert Simons, and today I'll be talking about when bad things happen to good scripts, error handling in PowerShell. We will be talking about the fundamentals of error handling in PowerShell, mostly concentrating on PowerShell version 7, with some Windows PowerShell 5.1 examples thrown in on the side. Everything that I will be talking about today will be applicable towards Windows PowerShell 5.1 and PowerShell 7. I have the obligatory slides, only three I promise. The rest is looking at code in Visual Studio or examples at the PowerShell prompt. So let's get rid of this slide and let's set up my environment and set up my environment. And what we're going to be going and take a look at here is four example scripts getting the last reboot time of supplied list of computers in the computer.txt file. Now, as an aside, error handling and documentation tends to be an afterthought when putting together scripts, functions, and, and commandlets, especially if you're new to this. We are going to look at these four examples and see how they handle errors or how they don't handle errors. And originally, we're just going to be going and take a look at the output, and then afterwards, we're going to be going and take a look at the code that created that output. So I'm going to go and take a look at, at the first example here. And as I said, we're using the Win32 operating system class to go and find the last boot up time of a supplied list of computers. And that supplied list of computers has eight computers in it. So here is an example of no error handling. So from an end user perspective, I am seeing a wall of red. Well, actually with Windows 7, it's no longer a wall of red. We see nice blue, blue, blue highlights. However, the end user has no context regarding what went wrong. I see the fact that I've got error messages. I, I see the fact that I've got information about five, five computer names, and I don't know what's going kind of falling off in the crack. When you go and take a look at the same script running under Windows PowerShell 5.1, you see the familiar wall of red. At least in this view, if I have some experience with going and reading through error messages, or I can read through the error messages, I find out that the three servers that have failed is Basilisk, Manticore, and, and, and Worm. Yes, there's a little bit of a token D&D &D type of theme there going. Um, when you go back and take a look at Windows PowerShell version 7, you don't get that server information in, in, in there. The, the, the shortened error messages doesn't actually give you this. So this is not the right way of doing things. Although, as I said earlier, many people think about how to handle errors and documentation last. So let's go and take a look at script number two. Script number two in comparison is nice and clean. I have no indication as an end user that there's anything wrong with what I've just gone and grabbed information from. If I didn't know that there were eight computers in the computers.txt file, I would assume that I got all the information that I went and requested. This is the equivalent of on error resume next for those that remember scripting in the good, well, maybe only old days of Visual Basic. Now, the, as I said, the end user thinks that everything's great, but it isn't. So the third example that I'm going to be going and showing you is where we've done a little bit of improvement here. We've actually went and determined that we had three machines that had issues with going and getting the last boot up time, and we've displayed a warning message out on the screen going and telling the end user, hey, the following machines I wasn't able to go and get information from. So at least now I'm aware as an end user that I've had problems with running this command. However, I can't really do anything with that from the pipeline perspective. I've written a warning out on the screen, and I'm now aware of it, but I can't put that into a pipeline and maybe put that off into a file off to the side, or maybe go and run some command list to, to, to go and do some diagnosis of that, or maybe separate off the good ones from, from, from the bad ones. So I'm now aware that I've had stuff fall, fall, fall through the cracks, but I can't really go and do anything with them. And then the last example that we have up here is where we've integrated the error messages into the output stream as objects. So now we can do some sorting and some uh, manipulation if we want. So we know that we've got five machines that were successful in getting the last boot up time. We know that there's three that are disconnected and we can continue on knowing that if we're gonna be piping something into the pipeline. 
So the real kicker behind all this is that we are using the same script here. The root of it, the root of all this was get sim instance dash class name, Win32 operating system, the computer name, and then putting an operational timeout on it. But they all have a very different output. As I said before, my name is Robert Simons. I'm a team lead for a North American engineering company. We have about 75 points of presence looking across North America in both Canada and the United States. I've been in IT for longer than I care to admit. Uh, it is a good race between being the father of a 23-year-old son and being in IT causing the gray hairs that I have on my head. I'm also passionate about automation. I use PowerShell to kill, squash, eliminate, well, maybe pulling this back over to PG rating, solve my problems in my day-to-day -day activities. Let's go back and take a look at a little bit of code. So, as I said, we showed you four different examples of scripts and how they handled or didn't handle um, error messages. So let's go and take a look at the code that actually generated that output. So when I'm going and take a look at the first example, this is just basic uh, get sim instance with the Win32 operating system. And I've um, changed CS name into computer name just for easier readability. Um, no error handling whatsoever. Everything that dies here just falls on the floor. So we put some improvements, if you can call them improvements, into the second and uh, example, and this is where I've suppressed all the errors. Now this is not a good thing. Um, not indicating to the person that's using your script whether things have gone wrong or not is bad. Um, I've used error action, which we will be going and talk about later, to just basically suppress all those error messages. So example number three has some warnings in it. In example number three is using the concept of error variables, which again, we were, we're going to talk about later, and then going and seeing whether there's any errors from the get sim instance commandlet. And if there are, it will go and enumerate those errors and put out the computer name that went and generated them. And it's going to do that by going into the error stack and pulling out the original, uh, the origin information dot ps computer name. And then it'll display that out on the screen. And finally, the last script has better error handling because in here I'm using the same concept of error action and error variable, but I'm going and seeing whether there are any errors within the get sim instance. And going back to the objects that I'm placing out in the get sim instance, I'm actually placing in a status property. And, and the successful um, enumeration of the Win32 operating system class comes back and puts that as connected. For the ones that have errors, instead I'm putting out a status of disconnected and I'm putting out a blank uh, last boot up time. So as mentioned above, all of these scripts are using the same base code. It's all using sim instance and Win32 operating system WMI class. So where do you find error messages? Well, there's a built-in variable called dollar $error. If I run that here, I'm not going to get anything back because this is a brand new terminal. But dollar $error is a built-in variable that con contains an array of error objects that represent errors in your session. And you can have up to a maximum of 256 by default in this error stack. And if you're up to 256 errors and you place in another error, the oldest error drops off the stack. So your most recent error is always going to be the first error object in the array called error uh, number zero. So let's go and take a look at this when I'm actually in a session that I've had a, a little bit more errors. So in here, if I go into dollar error, I have a ton of errors. Actually, it's an array. So you should be able to figure out exactly how many errors that you have. 61, so I've been busy. And if I want to go and take a look at the latest error in here, it's error and then element zero of that array. If I go back and take a look at uh, Windows 
uh, sorry, PowerShell version 7, PowerShell version 7, they revamped error handling in a big way. So if you do get error, you actually get that top error on the stack, and you get a huge amount of information regarding it. It actually goes and expands all the nested objects within that error object. Um, so you can see this and all of the references back to the nested um, objects. So when you go and take a look at exception, these are the um, properties of exception. These are the properties of target site, and it displays it quite nicely. When you're going and doing with version 5, you don't see that as nicely. So let me go and take a look at the top error in the error stack on version 5. And this is what I see. So it's a default view. Someone's decided that this is the information that you actually want to see when you're going and taking a look at an error. There's a lot more sitting back there. But again, it's all nested information. And getting information out is a little bit of a task. So if I want to go and take a look at all the information back there, doing select star gives me all the information on the object. And if I want to go and take a look at the exception information, I need to de dig one more level down and go and take a look at all the information there. So it's a little bit more work when you're sitting over on uh, Windows PowerShell 5.1 to actually go and get error information. So now let's pivot and talk about terminating versus non-terminating errors. So non-terminating error is an error that throws an error out to the error stream but does not terminate the current execution. These are the majority of the errors that are out there. So let's go and take a look at an example. Actually, let me clean up my previous examples and then let me open up this. So we have a business flow here. HR supplies a list of authorized users to approve expense claims in a file. We process that file daily, and we make sure that people in the AD group are the people in the file. Now, if you go and take a look at the logic, this is not written very well. Uh, and I'll get back to that in a moment. So let's go and try running that. But I, first of all, I want to go and show you who's in the expense approval group within Active Directory. So we have one, two, three, we have about eight or nine managers here. We're going to go and run example number five. And example number five is going to go out, attempt to access a non-existent file server, and continue running. Now, the way that the logic is in example number five is that it goes and grabs that file, it goes and grabs all the users that are currently in the AD group, and then it goes and takes a look to see whether the authorized users that it grabbed off the file is one of the, the user in the group is actually part of the authorized users. And if it isn't, well, it goes and gets removed. It. We've basically gone and created an issue for our, for our help desk. Because if we go and take a look at what's in the expense approval a, a, AD group, it's now empty. So bad logic, but also bad error handling because it shouldn't have gone and continued if it couldn't go and find, find the file. Let's go and take a look at another example of basic arithmetic. So we're putting in two numbers here, number one and number two. We're doing addition, subtraction, division, and multiplication on those numbers. So let's go and give an example, six and 12. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that those are the correct numbers that we're expecting. Now, how does that handle the second number being a zero. And unfortunately, our math system doesn't handle division by zero very well, and we see a runtime exception there. However, it continued executing the script afterwards. So you notice that when we have six divided by zero equals, and then we have a blank there, uh, and then it continues with the multiplication. So these are non-terminating errors. Terminating errors are not as common as non-terminating errors. They mostly deal with environmental stuff like running out of memory. Unfortunately, this is stuff that I cannot really emulate very well in a presentation. But let's go and take a look at some examples. So going and taking a look at terminating pipeline error. So looking at this code, I am going and trying to do a directory on uh, um, 
or sorry, do a content listing of a directory, and then I'm trying to do a filter to go and find out files that are um, younger than seven days old, and then sorting by last write time. Unfortunately, I can't spell very well, and I've misspelled object. Now notice I put a write output after error line, so let's go and try running that. So I get an error back. Uh, actually, I get two error back because the presentation directory uh, doesn't exist. And also, uh, by the way, uh, the where object is misspelled and it's not recognized as command function or script file. However, you notice that I had the after error line. So it continued running everything in there, but it did stop the pipeline because it didn't know what to do. So it didn't terminate the flow in exactly, but it did terminate the pipeline. Um, terminating errors are somewhat difficult to do. Um, so I've put together a quick script here that throws this as a terminating error. So assuming that this is working all correctly, we should never see the output line saying you will not see this. And let's go run that. And we get an exception on, on line four going and saying that this is a terminating error and we didn't see that right output line, which is what we're expecting. So let's pivot here and let's talk about how we handle non-terminating errors. There's a global variable out there called error action preference. And error action preference is telling the shell how you want to react to non-terminating errors. And the default is continue. So this sets up how you're gonna handle non-terminating errors globally. You can set this up on commandlets, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now, what we're gonna go and do is we're gonna go and save what the current um, error action preference is, so we can reset it after we go and do this example. And you wanna reset it to whatever the user or your environment set it to initially so that there's no surprises after your script stops running. So we're going to save it into original error action preference and then we're going to be going and setting it to stop. Now we're going to do the arithmetic example that we've been playing around with beforehand of dividing six by zero and seeing what exactly goes and happens. And as you notice, we've stopped at the line that says, hey, I've detected that you tried to divide by zero and it didn't continue on with the rest of the script. And this is what we were expecting. So we're gonna be going and setting the error action preference back to its default, which is continue, and I'll just prove that that's done. Now, it's preferred not to set this globally as we being humans, we are a forgetful bunch and we tend to forget to set things back. However, there are some use case scenarios that you'll need to use it. And as I mentioned above, you can also do this on uh, commandlet using a parameter called error action. And this is what you want to do when a non-terminating error occurs within a commandlet. And there's multiple different options here. There's six different options. There's suspend, ignore, inquire, continue, stop, and silently continue. And we've kind of went through some of these before, but I haven't really kind of explained them. So with no error action parameter, I'm gonna go and try to get non-existent directory. And non-existent directory doesn't exist and the error comes out on the screen. Now, suspend is only available for workflows and workflows were a very Windows type of thing. So they aren't supported in PowerShell 6 and above. So I'm not gonna be going and demoing them. Ignore suppresses the error message and continues executing the command. It does not add the error message to the dollar error automatic variable, which is kind of interesting. So I'm gonna go and try to go and take a look for the contents of non-existent directory two with the error action of ignore. And we didn't get any error, which is what we were expecting. So I'm gonna use get error and, uh, and a parameter that I haven't used before called, called newest. I'm gonna go back and take a look at the last three, three, three error messages and get the exception message for those errors. I don't wanna see all the errors, I just wanna see the ex exception message. And strangely enough, ignore work. It did not put that error onto the error stack. So inquire displays the error message and prompts you for confirmation before continuing execution. 
this value is rarely used. And I'm, to be honest, I don't really know why it's there. Um, so let's go and run this. We're going to go and get child, or sorry, do a directory listing on non-existent directory three. And up comes the prompt saying, cannot find C colon backslash non-existent directory three because it does not exist. Are we surprised? Not really. So we're just gonna say, we're gonna say yes. And we see the error message, and it stops. It doesn't go into the sort object. Continue, well, continue is, uh, displays the error message and continues executing the command. As we saw beforehand, continue is the global default for what happens when you run into a non-terminating error. We are not going to demonstrate this. Stop displays the error message and stops executing the command. Now. This example is kind of trivial because we have no commands below it, so it really can't stop and show us that, but there you go. It says that it can't find non-existent directory four. Silently continue, we've run into this one within the past examples. Uh, silently continue just continues on and doesn't put out any error messages, but it's slightly different from, from ignore because it actually puts the error onto the error stack. So we're going to go and try to go and get and find non-existent directory number five. And of course, that doesn't exist, but we don't get any error message. So if we go back and take a look at the last couple of error messages, we see that um, non-existent directory five is on the error stack. Okay, so the commandlet parameter error action overrides the global error action preference. Now, as I said, there are some commandlets that don't work well with error action. A common offender is 80 commandlets and the keyword silently continue, although there may be other commandlets that don't work very well with it. So let's say I have this um, logic flow that I wanna go and take a look into AD and see whether a user exists. And if the user exists, I wanna do a bunch of tasks on it. If the user doesn't exist, then I wanna do different tasks on it. Think about provisioning a user and seeing whether you have a user collision. So if we go and run this script and then wait a bit, and wait a little bit more, So what's going to happen is that we're going to get an error message back from AD user. And we just got an error message back from, from AD user saying the operation returned because the timeout limits was exceeded. However, we said silently continue. So AD user doesn't really respect the silently continue on error action. And this doesn't work on version 7 of PowerShell or Windows PowerShell version 5.1. The way to get around this is to set the global error action preference. Do your command with the AD commandlet and then set it back to the original setting. So we're gonna be setting the global error action to silently continue, but because we're good coders, we're gonna save what the current value of that is so we can go back to it. And then we're gonna go and say get AD user non-existent user two, just so we don't confuse the previous version of the example. And then we're gonna be setting the error action back. So. We went and did get AD users. We didn't see any error messages. However, when we go and take a look at the error messages, the last error, we see non-existent error, uh, sorry, non-existent user two coming up as the error stack. Uh, are there other commandlets out there that don't work well with the error action parameter? Um, I can definitely talk about the AD ones. There may be other ones, I'm not sure. So. Where do you store your errors besides dollar error? So we can use another parameter, error variable, and you saw that in the original examples of I think it was example three and example four. Um, and uh, you, can stare, you can store the entire error information within that error variable. Some things to note, you don't use a dollar sign in front of the error variable parameter. Uh, this is something specific towards error variables when you're going and taking a look at using that parameter for, for, for commandlets. So we're going to go and try to find out the uh, directory or directory listing for non-existent directory 5. And uh, we're going to silently continue and throw it into error child item. So 
No error message. We were expecting that. Let's go and see what's an error child item. So cannot find the path, non-existent directory 5. All good. Let's go and find out what's in non-existent directory 6. Yeah, I know. I need to be more, more original in my examples here. So no error message. This is good. We asked it to, to, to not give back any error messages. And if we go and take a look at error child item, we only see that error value. So if you want to append errors into that error variable, you need to use a plus sign in front of the parameter, or sorry, in front of the variable. So if we do um, non-existent directory seven, and we do uh, add it to the error variable error child item, we again get no error messages, we're expecting that, but when we go and take a look at the variable error child item, we see that we have both the error for a non-existent directory seven and non-existent directory six. So there's a couple of things here that don't fit anywhere else that I'm just gonna make mention. A strange thing, write error doesn't actually write a terminating error. You can use write error to put out red text in front of your user and it won't terminate the thread of execution within your script. To write a terminating error with the command, you actually need to use dash error action stop. What happens if you want to find out if a command, an executable, did it work or not? Well, you can use the, um, the variable, the built-in variable, last exit code. So let me give you an example here. Let me go and ping Google. And if Google's up, excellent, Google's up, everyone can relax. So we successfully ping Google. Now, if we go and take a look at the last exit code, we get a zero. So the convention out there is that if you're writing an, ex sorry, if you're putting together an executable, you return an exit code of zero if everything was successfully done. If everything wasn't successful, if there was an error or something along those lines, then you would return a non-zero. Normally a one, potentially you'd be coding in errors for, for, for what type of error actually happened. It really depends upon the person that put together the command. So we're gonna go and ping, this really doesn't exist. And originally I tried, this doesn't exist, but strangely enough, that, um, that domain actually resolves. So let's try pinging, this really doesn't exist, and hey, ping request could not find the host, this really doesn't exist, strange that. So let's go and find out the last exit code. And the last exit code is a one. Now, if you're going to be using this within your scripts, I would recommend that you go through a couple of error, error uh, cases and scenarios to make sure that the uh, executable works as you expect it to. Uh, some executables out there say the executable ran successfully, but didn't return the information that you were looking for, but still gives you an error code of zero. Kind of strange. So we've gone over uh, where to store your variables. Uh, we've gone over, uh, sorry, where, where your errors are stored. We've gone over where to store your errors. Uh, we've gone over um, non-terminating and terminating um, uh, exceptions, and we've gone and talked about a couple of odd things off on the side. So let's go and talk about how to handle errors. And there's a couple of different aspects here. So we're going to be going and first taking a look at validating. So in other words, what happens if bad inputs are placed into your scripts and errors are thrown because of those bad inputs? Now, I'm going back to my old friend, arithmetic. And arithmetic doesn't do any error handling or error validation. It will take in, the only thing that it does regarding a parameter is that it confirms that it's an integer. You can't put in um, a floating number or anything like that. Uh, but otherwise it doesn't do any real validation. So the concept here is that you can do parameter validation and, and throw an error when you see a zero, because we know divide by zero on number two doesn't work very well. You can trap the error and give a warning or an error based off of that incorrect value, or you can let everything fall on the floor and let the user deal with it. As you probably already realized, the last option is not acceptable. So again, just going through and saying nothing's changed in arithmetic, it still does the arithmetic normally. And let's go and divide by zero, and we're expecting an error. Yep, we divided by zero, 
we got an error and we didn't get any input in there and it did not stop the execution. This is all stuff that we're expecting. I haven't changed anything on you. So let's go and take a look at the code behind arithmetic validation. So in here, I've put in a validate range on the number two that you're placing in as a parameter. Now, validate allows you to do uh, validation on rather different things when you're looking at the parameter set. You don't need to basically write your own validation script. That's already kind of plugged into uh, the language already. So uh, I'm sitting here and saying the range needs to be between one and a very large number. That's the maximum number that you can place into an integer in PowerShell. So if I put in number two as a zero, what comes back? I get, I cannot validate argument on parameter number two. The zero argument is less than the minimum allowed range of one. Suppose, uh, Supply an argument that is greater than or equal to one and then try the command again. So I've done some parameter validation, but I've also limited the user into what they can actually place in here because an integer can be a positive or a negative number. And I've just sat down and said, hey, you know what? You can't put negative numbers in here anymore. You need to put in a number between one and the maximum integer value. That does parameter validation, but it also changes around how that script actually works. So let's go and take a look at arithmetic validation part number two. And part number two is that I'm actually putting in a validation script. And I realize that I just said that the validate areas don't mean that you need to script it. There is actually an option called validate script. And I've went in and said, hey, the number that you're passing me, that would be the dollar underscore, if it's not equal to two, return true. So in other words, the validate script worked. Else, Throw a terminating error saying, hey, number two cannot equal zero. And again, I haven't changed anything else in the file. So let's go back to this example and let's again use number six as number, the first parameter value, and number zero as uh, the second parameter value. And let's see what happens. So we get a cannot value, uh, validate argument on parameter number two, number two cannot equal zero. And this is what we threw here. Number two cannot equal zero. It's relatively clean, simple error message, easily understandable, a little bit better than the default range error message that we got out of validate range. So there's quite a few blogs out there about doing parameter validation. I've only scraped the surface here. Uh, Mike F. Robbins did a talk in PowerShell Summit 2018, Write Award-Winning PowerShell Functions and Script Modules. You can find it at YouTube, um, and he talks uh, about parameter validation and some options that you have there. But let me just give you an example here. So I'm going and validating IP4, the addresses, and I'm putting in a non-existent IPv4 address, 277, 277, 277, 277. I'm not going to repeat that again. I'm just going to say the IP address that I'm validating. So I go and run this, and it gives me back this ugly error message here, going and saying that the argument, the IP address, does not match, and this ugly string, and then it says it's pattern, and then repeats the ugly string saying, hey, you want to go and give me an argument that actually matches that, that, that ugly string. Or would you rather your user see this? Right? Cannot validate argument on parameter IPv4 address. That's the IPv4 address that I gave it. Is not a valid IPv4 address. Cryptic or not cryptic? Know your audience. And I would vote for not cryptic. I don't want error messages to be convoluted. I want the user to understand what's going on and what they need to do regarding the error message instead of having a red wall of uh, text go on the screen. So let's go and take a look at the code from the first one, the, the cryptic one. And this comes in here and there's a validate pattern option underneath the um, validate section. And that is an ugly string, a reg regular expression string that I went and Googled to go and validate an IPv4 address. And the validate pattern comes out and says, the pattern that you placed in, regular expression. Everyone understands regular expression, don't they? Probably not most users. 
uh, it puts that pattern out there a couple of times saying, hey, you didn't match this and you should match it. Not very user friendly. Or you can go and take a look at the other code. Now, this is a module. It's a PSM1. Uh, it's a PSM1 because I'm actually placed out a different function to test the IPv4 address. So when you go and take a look at the original code, new IPv4 address, um, and it's going to go and come in here and say, I'm going to go and test it and, and pass that information off as a script. And then I'm going to write out the IPv4 address. The test function here goes and puts that ugly regular expression line in. And then, hey, if it matches, it comes back as true. If it doesn't match, it actually gives readable information back to the user going and saying, hey, what you gave me wasn't a valid IPv4 address. And it doesn't make mention of that ugly regular expression. Okay, let's go and talk about trapping error messages. And there's this construct out there called try catch. And there's a little bit more to it, but we'll kind of catch that later. Oh, that was ugly. So let's go and kind of take a look at arithmetic error handling. Um, back to our regular arithmetic uh, statement. There's no parameter validation in here. I'm not trying to capture the error message or I'm not trying to capture the invalid parameter. I'm trying to actually handle the error condition itself. So when you come down to the divide area, you see a new script block called try. And in try, I'm doing a divide of number one by number two, which we know is going to fail when number two is zero. And there's a catch block in there. And the catch block basically says, if something blows up as a terminating error in the try, run the catch block. So in other words, here the catch block is going to come out and say, hey, you know what? You asked me to do something impossible, and I'm going to tell you that I can't do that. So let's go and try running that with our normal number one being six and normal number two being zero. And as you see, we get the addition, the subtraction, we get an error message coming out and saying, hey, you know what? In your math system, I can't divide six by zero. And then we get six multiplied by zero. So it all works out well. So we're now going to be kind of throwing another wrinkle into this, going and saying, how about you catch with specific exception types? So we're going to go and take a look at error handling part two. An error handling part two has the try and has two catch blocks. You, yes, you can have multiple different catch blocks. And this is the error exception that is trying to track catch. So what it will do is that it'll blow up in the try block. It will go and find the type of exception. And if it matches this exception type, it will go and run everything within that catch script block. If it doesn't match that exception type, it's going to go down to the next catch block and it attempt to match that exception type. And if there's no exception type there, then that's kind of your fall through scenario. So in here, it's going to say, hey, unable to divide uh, number by number. And if it doesn't match that exception type, it's going to say, hey, you know what? This is an unexpected number, uh, unexpected error that I don't know how to handle. So if we use our standard six and zero, uh, with arithmetic error handling, part two. And we run that. We get unable to divide six by zero. So the exception error handling that I placed in there, how did I get that? And this is where PowerShell version five is a little bit more complicated than PowerShell version seven. So let me go under Windows PowerShell version 5.1 and do one divided by zero. And I get an attempted to divide by zero, an error. We, we were expecting that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the latest error on the error stack, which is the one divided by zero, go and take a look at the exception, go and get the type of exception and return the full name. And here I have system.management.automation.runtime exception. Now, is the only thing that will be thrown out by runtime exception one divided by zero? Probably not. Could I go into the code and sit down and say, okay, I'm going to actually go and try to determine what type of runtime exception? 
Probably. Would I do that in production code? Probably, yes. But let me go back to my examples here. So in version 7, it's a heck of a lot easier because of the way that they've gone and changed how error handling happens. So if I do 1 divided by 0 here, I get attempted uh, to divide by 0. We're expecting that. But if I do get error, get error goes and gets me all the information that's in that rich error object and comes back and says system management automation runtime exception. So that's how I got that information. So um, you can put multiple different error exception types in a try catch. You want to put the most specific exception type to the least ex specific exception types because exceptions are only matched once. So let me go back and take a look at that HR value or that HR scenario that we were having in beforehand. So again, just reviewing the business flow, they give us a file for authorized users to approve expense claims. We process that file daily and make sure that people in the group in AD are the people in the file. So in here, what I've changed is I put in a try catch block. Actually, I put in a couple of catch blocks. And in the try, anything that errors out within the try is going to go into the catch block. So I am right now going and uh, catching for an item not found. I'm also catching for uh, an access denied. And then I have a kind of fall through saying, hey, if you get to this point, something went wrong that I wasn't expecting. And we're going to be going and running this across a couple of different things. So the first one, we're going to be running that against that non-existent file server out there. So at this point in time, I'm going and trying to get a file that doesn't exist because uh, whack whack file server doesn't exist, and I get back a file not found. Excellent. I have a file out there called can't access this, and this is specifically set up where I do not have rights to go and access this file. So if I go in here into 5.1, and I go and try to get contents of this, you will notice is denied. Access to the path is, is denied. I do not have rights to, to access this file. So when I run this, I'm expecting not to see file not found. I'm expecting that this goes and falls into the next specific exception type of the catch, and it does. I get join path, uh, sorry, I get uh, access denied. So I'm now going to go and supply it with something that it's not expecting. I'm going to supply it with a directory. This should be interesting. So I go and su supply it with a directory, and it comes back and says, unexpected error, unable to get contents because it's a directory. Hey, please use the get child item instead. Thank you very much, version 7, for giving me an example of the right object to go and give you. So you can actually combine error exception types in one catch. So let's go take a look at that. So instead of having different catches here, having different exceptions, I'm putting them all together using a comma to, con, um, to connect, concatenate them together. So if I see an item not found exception or an unauthorized access exception, I'm going to say unable to, to, to access the file. And I have the normal catch through. So going back over here, I'm going to go again and try to get to that file server that doesn't exist. And I'm expecting to get back a file not found. Uh, sorry, an unable to access file. Let me double check that. Yes, an unable to, to, to access file. Great. I'm going to go and do this against that file that I can't read. I get the same error message. So both exceptions are being caught in the same catch statement. You can actually nest these things too. So let's go and take a look at that code. And same business flow, except I have a try and a catch block around my AD access, and I have a try and a catch block around accessing that file. So I go back over here, and I go and say, hey, go and try to go and access that file that I can't access, hey, access denied. Well, that's correct. Now I'm going to go and supply it with a bunch of users that do exist, and I'm going to go and uh, attempt to go and look that up with a domain controller that does not exist. So if you go and take a look up here, I'm going to a server, no DC. So this should come back with an error message, except it's going to take its time going and doing so. Okay, I'm going to go and, well, there you go, supplied AD servers down. So, 
AD down exception, supplied servers down. So, so that's what we were expecting. So like I said, you can nest these. <clears throat> finally, well, there's a finally portion of try catch. And finally, always runs. Well, there are some edge cases. This is utilized for mostly resource cleanup that you want to happen even if the script went off the rails. So an example, clean up the connections to a database that you're connecting to. If I get information from the database, that's great. If I don't get information from the database, I'm still going to clean up that connection. So let me go and take a look at example number six. And if you go and take a look at example number six, we're going back to that AD example of going and trying to find non-existent user two. However, if we find it, that's great. If we don't find it, we want to write out an error message. But no matter what we do, we want to make sure that we set back the global variable error action preference to what the original value was. So let's go in here and run that. So you will see that it was originally continue. We changed that to stop. The finally value comes out and says, hey, I flipped it back to continue, and we get the error saying, hey, I cannot find an object with identity non-existent user 2. So what are those edge cases? What happens if in your catch statement you rebooted the computer running the script? Do you think that that finally script block will run? Theoretically, I'm just talking the, the theoretically is because no, I'm not rebooting my workstation in the middle of a presentation. That would just be bad. So we do a one divided by zero, which is definitely a terminating error. And then it comes into the catch block going saying, hey, restart computer, and I threw what if in there. Uh, and then the finally, I put them in a little bit of sleep and then try writing off to a log file going and saying, hey, this won't show up in the log file because the machine is re rebooting, nor will the right output. And I actually tried this on a real VM, and the finally block did not stop the restart. So going and taking a look at this, these are the basics of handling errors in PowerShell. You have the choice of providing good information to your customers when things go wrong or let everything fall onto the floor. Choose wisely. And as I said, I had three slides. So get contact. I am on Twitter, although I'm much more of a consumer than a poster. Uh, I am on also GitHub. Uh, there will probably be a link to this on the uh, information regarding the presentations for the summit this year. I am also on Discord. Um, I look forward to roaming the halls of the conference center next year when we can do this on, in person. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Be safe. Have a great day.